If you can open with me to two places, please. <clears throat> We're going to get into this message. I've got short time. Wish I had long time. I could preach on this subject literally for, for hours and hours. Uh, it's a subject that needs to be referenced when you're talking about the Holy Spirit and doing a whole series on the Holy Spirit. This is something that, that needs to be brought up, needs to be talked about biblically according to the Bible account and according to where, where, where I see it as a pastor and as a uh, leader of Believer's Chapel, one who I got saved, I believe, at 11 years old. I'm 47 years old now. I've been in church my whole life, been in all kinds of different avenues of different churches, and we see things at times differently in different churches. But the great thing, please hear this, man, the great thing about Believer's Chapel is that we are a melting pot. We have people from all kinds of backgrounds. We have people from a Baptist background, Methodist, uh, from, from a charismatic background, background from a, from a uh, Pentecostal background, from, from a Catholic background, from a no church background, never been in church. They find themselves here and God does an amazing work in their lives and their families. And God has allowed us to be a melting pot. And in that, I realized my position as a church to communicate to, to every avenue in every type of denomination that may come in here with a different idea or a different thought. And uh, we're going to get into this this morning. We're going to be talking about uh, the, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're going to be talking about what that looks like biblically, how I see it. Where, where And again, I, I am not a deep, deep theologian. I'm not a Greek scholar. I don't study Greek. I don't speak Greek. I have my concordance. I look words up. I study words. I study the meaning, the prefix. The, I, I do study all of that, but I will not pretend to you that I, I speak Greek or Hebrew or Arabic because I don't. So there are many on, on all kinds of the sides of, of a different position in regards to this and uh, who love Jesus, who, who are absolutely sold out to Jesus, love the community. And we might find ourselves on different sides of the fence in this teaching this morning. Man, in this, I want you to realize that when we're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I, I want us to look at this in regards to uh, where Scripture brings this thing to a fold here, where, where Scripture brings this thing in. And I've, I've read books on this. I've studied this in detail. I uh, was in Charismatic Church for 12 years. It doesn't give me a one-up on anybody or anything. I've heard preaching on both sides of this from some of the best theologians, the best teachers on both sides of the fence in this thing. And uh, this is, what I look at this, is this is an orbit issue. You've got the sun 93 million miles away, this big beast of a ball of flame that everything really circles the sun. He, he, that, the sun's the nucleus of our system, and then you have planets that orbit the system. The sun, Jesus Christ, is the nucleus of our system. Here in Believer's Chapel, please hear this, here in BC, there's non-negotiables. There are things that are not up to debate. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus Christ came through a virgin birth. Jesus Christ is the only answer to salvation. Jesus Christ died, buried, resurrected again as our Savior and Lord. And there is no other option for eternal life except through Jesus. Nucleus, not debatable. God, there is God and there is Satan. Non-negotiable, not debatable. God is the creator of all things, the creator of the universe. Non-negotiable, not going to be debated in this church. Creation, God, period. And, and there's so many different things that are absolutely non-negotiable, non-debatable. There is heaven, there is hell. Non-debatable, non-negotiable, not budging. And then you have in the church, people who love Jesus, people who are going to heaven, people who absolutely are sold out to the things of the word of God and truth. There's orbit issues that are debatable within the church. Spiritual gifts, debatable in the church. Baptism in the Holy Spirit, debatable in the church. Um, you've got the eschatology, whether you are pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, debatable within the church. Whether you are free will or predestination, debatable within the church. Both sides love Jesus, love the Word of God, love the truth of God's Word, but both sides truly born again, going to heaven, but debatable. So I'm just, I'm just really pitching this to you, unlike the Cubs could do last night. I'm pitching a strike to you. That you would, that's going to be a tough battle. But I'm going to pitch a strike this morning in regards to where we lie as I lie. And, and, and I know this, man. I know that there are people who say, but Sean, I, I understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit a little differently. Well, I'm just telling you from a biblical point of view, man, I want, I want us to see this thing together as a church. Because what I believe the future of where Believer's Chapel is going, I want us to be uh, really unified in absolute complete unity it doesn't mean that everyone has to agree. Please hear that. 
Because we honestly, we, have, we are such a great community of a melting pot. We, we have people in this church that see things differently in regards to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We have people in this church that see things differently in regards to free will or predestination. We have things, we see things differently here in this church in regards to eschatology, uh, pre, mid, or post. I mean, that's, and that's fine. That is completely, totally fine as long as our non-debatables we're unified in that because those are most important. So I just, but this is something when you do a series on the Holy Spirit, it's something that, that must, really must be talked about and presented. So if you could, please, let me just pray. Ask God to bless it. God, this is your time. I ask that we would just be uh, hearers of your word today, hear from you today. God, that you'd move in this place. What a great time of worship. What a great time in your presence, God. We thank you for that. Your word is alive and it is powerful. Help us to leave this place even challenged today by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, two places, Romans 8, 1 Corinthians 12. We will start in Romans 8, please. Actually, you go to Romans 8. I'm going to go back to uh, John 16, where we kind of let off last week. John 16 says this, verse 7. Jesus is speaking. He says, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him. Listen, the Holy Spirit is the Comforter. He comes and he is sent by Jesus to us as our Helper. Jesus, we covered this briefly last week. It's to our advantage. That's what Jesus said. Listen, it's good that I go. His disciples are like, what? We have seen, who can be better than you? I'm like, what is it that, what does he mean it's to our advantage? It's to your advantage that I go because then I get to send the helper, the Holy Spirit to you. And man, when you begin to realize the, the, the absolute, complete and total need for the Holy Spirit. If you have Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit and there is a need there. And man, I want this series to open our eyes to the power and the authority, that which we can plug into, that which we can tap into because the Spirit of God dwells and lives within us. And this is what Jesus said. Listen, I'm going to send him to you. And I want you, I want you to see something. Romans 8 says this. Romans 8, verse 9. And I'm going to go over several verses here. They're going to be on the screen. I want you to see them. Verse 9 says this. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells, highlight that, dwells, it means to remain, abide, and live. If the Spirit of God lives, abides, dwells, and remains in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Listen, if you, what he's saying is you can't have any part of the Spirit unless you have Jesus. 1 Corinthians 12, 3, you can write that down. It says the same thing. Unless you have, unless you have Jesus, the, the Holy Spirit is the one who brought you to Jesus. Unless you have the Spirit, unless you have Jesus, you do not have the Holy Spirit. This is what he says. It's impossible. The two come together as one. Now look at this. Verse 10, if Christ is in you through the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. I love that. The same Holy Spirit in power and authority that raised Jesus from the dead dwells, remains, lives, or abides in you. He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who what? Where's the Holy Spirit? Abiding, dwelling, and living within you. I want you to see this. Let's go through some verses here. All right, come on. There's a serious point that the Bible makes. That is the spirit of truth, that's the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Where's the Holy Spirit? That's Jesus speaking. Where's the Holy Spirit? He's going to be in you. Peter said to them, repent, each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. Look at the next one. Do you not know? I love this. We covered this at youth group on Wednesday night. This was great. Do you not know? This is, this is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church that was a mess. They were divided. They were a mess. They were immoral. They were suing one another, taking people to court. And God said, listen, Paul was saying this is supposed to be handled by the church. Corinthians is a corrective book. And he says this. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Again, where is the Holy Spirit? He is in you whom you have from God and you are not your own. I love that. When you really come to the place to realize, when I have come to Christ, I've given up. I've surrendered. When I really understand that His Spirit dwells within me, when I come to Jesus, His Spirit comes in and makes me new. And this, this here, this body is no longer my own. For the, if you continue, in verse 20 it says, For you were bought with a price. 
We've got to realize the realization that when the Spirit of God comes and dwells, abides, and remains within you, He is in a position that is in you. Look at the next one. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Holy Spirit. So all through Scripture you see where the Holy Spirit and dwells us, we abide in Him, uh, we, we belong to Him in our bodies, and we surrender to Him, and we understand the position of the Holy Spirit. Where is He? He is in us. Okay, come on. Now, I, want, I, want, I want you to really identify this and understand this, because when you start talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, okay, when does that occur? If you, if you are in Christ, the big question is, do you have the Holy Spirit? I mean, I get, I get asked often, are you a spirit-filled church? Hmm. <laughs> well, and I know where they're coming from. I know what camp they belong to. I understand all that. Well, if, if we're in Christ, yes, he is in me. Well, are you a full gospel church? Well, we don't preach half gospel. I mean, like, I mean, these questions, that, but maybe you have experienced that. Maybe someone has come to you and asked you even questions about you personally or even questions about Believer's Chapel. And, uh, you know, that one is, it is, an, are you a spirit-filled church? Like, of course we are. We have Jesus. We expect the Spirit of God to fall in our services. We expect His presence to be known. We expect, man, we want to see God do incredible, incredible miracles. And in the position that I take in Scripture, it doesn't mean, oh, well, He just doesn't, Believe in the Holy Spirit. Are you, come on, you can't say that. I expect everything from the Holy, everything. I want anything that the Spirit of the living God will give. I want to walk in a sense of being full and control of Him, which we will communicate next week. Now we start getting into the goods next week. Don't miss next week. Be here next week. Bring a friend next week as we begin to communicate in regards to what being filled, the command of being filled really looks like and what is it as a believer who's walking under the fullness and the control of the Holy Spirit. So when we get this, Maybe some confuse what it is to be filled with the Holy Spirit complete, com compared to being baptized in the Holy Spirit. But that's next week in power and authority, and I can't wait to tap into that. But we look at this. I want to show you another verse here because here's where, where we start. When you start talking about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, there are seven places, church, seven places that baptism in the Holy Spirit is mentioned. That's it. Now, when you get into Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, and Acts 19, many would say that that is referenced there and I can, I, can, I can go there with that, but it's not mentioned there as baptism in the Holy Spirit. You've got, this is John the Baptist. Now, please hear this. And again, I have, I have read the books. I have been there, done that. I've been in the services. I've seen all kinds of things. And again, that doesn't make me, oh, I know this. Listen, I am learning. I am trying to dig into Scripture and study and study and study, even for me personally, again, to be refreshed in regards to how I see things is tremendous for me to do this. So when I see this, I see this as uh, John the Baptist. This is what John the Baptist is speaking. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he, that means Jesus, who is coming after me, is mightier than I, I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. You see this in Matthew 3. You've got Mark 1, 8, Luke, Luke 3, 16, John 1, 33. All four of those out of the seven, four out of seven, is referencing the same statement from the same man. This is John the Baptist, four out of seven times that it's mentioned, is referencing that Jesus is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's referencing a prophetic event bringing into Acts 2, okay? Um, Acts 1, 5, here it is. This is Jesus. Jesus is now speaking in a line in regards to reference of baptism in the Holy Spirit. You see John the Baptist, he's prophesying this. Four out of the seven is the same statement, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, then you have Jesus now in Acts 1, 5. And please hear this about Acts. This is something that we need to understand about the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a transitional book. The book of Acts is, is the Acts of the Apostles by the Holy Spirit. When you understand that it is a transitional book that takes the Old Testament and takes the New Testament, and there's a crash course between these two, and now the New Testament is where we live by. So we understand this as there had to have been a transition from those of the Old Covenant, from those who understood the Old Testament, who those who understood there are moments that the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament comes upon you, but He doesn't remain and dwell within you. There's a difference well, where's that transition takes place? 
And we see this in Acts 1.5. Jesus himself says, not many days from now you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Sixth reference. I'm, I'm sorry, fifth reference. Again, speaking of what John the Baptist was referencing to, this is Acts 1 going into Acts 2 where we see the Holy Spirit fall and fill them at Pentecost. Now I know this is a lot, but we're going somewhere here. I want you to see this because right after he says in Acts 1.5, we talked about it last week, and you will be filled with power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, please don't miss this. I need you to attach what Jesus told his disciples. I need you to, to see what Jesus told his Jewish disciples. You are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And in that, there will be power that comes upon you to what? Be my witnesses to Jerusalem and Judea. That's to the Jews. To, to, to Samaria. That's the Samaritans who the Jews desperately hated. And to the rest of of the world or to the utter ends of the earth and that's to the Gentiles that's to me and you just remember that he says listen not many days from now you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit and you will be filled with power when you're filled with the Holy Spirit and to, to be my witnesses to your own people got it to Samaria hold on and to the Gentiles not really a fan so what do you see then in Acts 2 you see the Holy Spirit fall at Pentecost. You see in Acts 8, the Holy Spirit falls to Samaria, to the Samaritans. Now listen, for, and when you, I, want, I need you to dig into this yourself, please. Please just don't take my word for it. Dig into Scripture and see the purpose. Understanding Acts is a transitional book. You see this purpose of, of the Holy Spirit falling in the same way. What are they referenced? Man, the same thing happened in Acts 2. But these are the Samaritans. Could it be? That they're actually involved in grace? Could it be the same way God loves us, the same way that God saved us, that Jesus died for them? Is it even possible? No way. How would they know? And all this comes to a true clear picture in Acts 10 when you see Peter, he goes to Cornelius, who's a Gentile, to his Gentile family and relatives and people who are on his team, his staff, so to speak, and you see here Peter goes into them and he even references to Cornelius. Do you realize that I'm even breaking the law being in your house? But God showed me a dream and he told me to come. You, you had a dream and I had a dream pretty much the same time. And my dream where God was saying, Peter, listen to me. Don't call unholy what I've called clean. And it's amazing that the next day, God's timing is amazing. The next day, people from Cornelius' house show up and say, hey, you need to come to Cornelius because God showed him a dream. And what God was saying is, listen, the Gentiles are no longer unholy. They're part of the package. And when he left, you realize that, that Jerusalem, the Jews, the council was upset. Like, you can't go into their house. You're not supposed to be a part of them. And he even references that to Cornelius. It's against the law for me to be in your house. And as he is speaking, the Bible says the Holy Spirit falls on them. And then he references in Acts eleven sixteen 16, as he is back now to the council, communicating to them where the council was upset. Like, what are you doing in their house? No, 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 you guys got to understand. Remember when, when Jesus told us? Remember when he said, listen, you are going to be, be filled with power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Yes, that happened in Acts 2. To be my witnesses in, in Samaria. Yes, that happened in Acts 8. To be my witnesses in, in around the world. That's the Gentiles. That was Acts 10. And he brings the whole story back you know how I know it's true because in the same way that the Holy Spirit fell on us in Acts 2 it's the same way that he fell on them God's grace is for them and you and I I'm a Gentile you and I who are Gentiles should be amazed and blessed and thank you that that's the truth then you see a very similar story in Acts 19 where now Paul is beginning to reach Ephesus and he says, have, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? And they're like, well, we've never even heard of the Holy Spirit. And we've already read and understood from Scripture, you can't have the Holy Spirit until you have Jesus. And they said, well, we've been baptized under John's baptism. They were followers of John, not Jesus. And they come to a point to say, all right, now we've been baptized in Jesus. We know Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit falls on them. So here you see six out of seven references in regards to baptism and the Holy Spirit really deal with an Acts 2 event. Six out of seven. Five of them are prophetic. Acts 11:16 16 was referencing what 
what took place then and equating it to the same thing, going back to the Jewish council, say, man, they're in. And again, this is a transitional book from the old to the new. And when you begin to see the seventh statement, and I encourage you, please read Acts 10, read Acts 11. See the, the main point of going back to saying, listen, God has accepted all of us. But the big point, please hear this, to the Holy Spirit is found in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And there will be others that would, this is where their teaching varies from, from where I see Scripture. But it all comes down, please hear this, man, it all comes down to one word, one two-letter word. And again, this is where I am. Honestly, before you, I'm out of my league when it comes to the Greek language and, and the Hebrew language. But I can study and I can read and I can follow. And, and when I see that all seven statements in regards to baptism and the Holy Spirit through Scripture are grammatically Greek the same. And if you dig in, I use the New American Standard. I believe that's the closest to the original. If you have the NIV, NIV, you will see one word here. Look at this, verse 13. For by one spirit. Here's where everything gets flipped upside down. Where they say, well, the rest, the other six are within or with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is by the Holy Spirit. When you go back to the original writing of this, even in your side notes, it'll probably even say in or with. It's the same language throughout. So when, when Paul is writing this, for some reason, the English, the English translation, they switched it, and Paul is writing in the day, nobody would have thought otherwise. So he says this. My version on the side note says, for in one spirit or for with one spirit, and you can do a study, all versions are different on this, and they just bring it down by one word. They come up with, well, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is separate from conversion. That's what people say. And I can't get there from here. Even being in that, that type of setting for 12 years, I never got there in there. I've heard the teaching. I've read the books. I've studied and studied. Of course, man, I'm, one, I'm a seeker. God, I want everything that you have for me, God, I want. If there's more to this, God, I want it. If I'm missing something, God, I want it. Then I went into this confusion going, man, this is what they teach, but God, I, I, I see it differently in regards to why am I seeking something that I already have? I have your Holy Spirit abiding in me. How could there be more than that? I believe that you can do all things. I believe the Spirit of God fills me. There is a presence in me that has power and authority. God, I believe that you can raise the dead. I believe that you can heal the sick and the lame. I believe that you can show up in a room, God, in power and might. But God, if there's more, I'm missing something. I went on this thing just trying to get more. And I come to 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. You know what the baptism of the Holy Spirit does? Please hear this. Church, please hear this. It unifies the body. It unifies the body. And I'm in this place. And I know, I know as I speak this, there's many of you in this place saying, Sean, I don't agree because I've understood the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I, I've understood that experience. And, and I'm not going to take away from that. I'm asking you to re-examine it in a sense of maybe it was the filling of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says to be kept filled over and over and over, walking in a sense to surrender yourself to Him where there is a filling of the Holy Spirit that now I'm walking under control of Him. Maybe it was something like that. Or, and I'm not here to even, even debate to say, well, I don't, I know, no longer here. But that's, that's not what we're doing here. I'm just saying, listen, when we, when we do a series on, on the Holy Spirit, you've got to understand the position of this church in regards to the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a confusing thing. And it's unfortunate because those who believe this, those who see it as a second event, it automatically, whether they want to or not, some do, some don't, whether they want to or not, it automatically sets up a two-class system for Christianity. Automatically. Automatically. Well, I've been baptized and you haven't. And I've heard that. Well, no, actually, by one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. No, it's a unifying event, not a dividing event. And it automatically brings this two-class system to Christianity. I have, you don't have. Isn't it amazing that after Acts 19, 
You don't see this again in regards to those being saved. You don't hear about baptism in the Holy Spirit until uh, 1 Corinthians 12, but you don't see it in the epistles. You don't see it in, in the letters written to the saints. Nowhere does it say, you need this. Nowhere in Scripture does it tell us to even seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's just something that automatically happens when you get saved. You are now, in a sense, of baptized in the Holy Spirit that immerses you into one body. And you look at Acts 2, 8, 10, and 19, and these are amazing, beautiful, truthful examples of the Holy Spirit falling and them receiving the Holy Spirit as different people groups according to Acts 1, 8. Please do your due diligence and put things together. Because, man, I do not want a church that's filled with a two-class Christianity. I have and you don't have and you should have. And if you don't have, you have less than I have. I just don't see it. How is it that we can go to the Dominican Republic? How is it that we can go to India and Africa? How is it that we can go to Cuba when I went there, when the borders were closed? How is it that we can go around the world to people and automatically, automatically, because we all have been baptized by one spirit into one body, there is a connection automatically that the same Holy Spirit that's in them is the same Holy Spirit that is in me, and there is a connection. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit unifies unifies not confusing nowhere in scripture do you see a two class Christianity nowhere can I ask you what's common in scripture like was this the norm did they go church to church in, in the letters to the, to the churches in the letters to the pastors did they, did they go and say this is a must you need to do this it, it wasn't normal it wasn't the norm. It wasn't what was stated to do. And I want us to have a, a, a depth of understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit within us. And again, I, am trying, I want to be very, very careful on this in the position of those who are in this church who do see it differently. Again, this is an orbit issue. Absolutely can be debated. But I'm not going to base everything on a two-letter word of by whether it could be in or with. I, I can't get there from that one single two-letter word. And you look at this, and I want to just share with this with, in regards to maybe even hearing a sense of, well, I was told I need more of the Holy Spirit. Or man, maybe, maybe you've heard somebody say, man, you need more of the Holy Spirit. And I just... Honestly, my heart breaks when I hear that in a sense of, are you kidding me? God has filled me in his Holy Spirit and, and he is indwelt in me and he abides in me. And when you understand the whole thing about coming to Christ, when you really, really understand the basis of salvation is this position here. This, this is the basis of salvation that I have confessed that you are Lord. I've confessed means agreement. I've made an agreement that you are master, that you are Lord. And I come to this place to lay it down, deny myself daily. And I've come to this place. And a major word is surrender. That's, that's the Christian faith, is that we surrender to him. And man, I could... In my own journey, like, God, I need more. If there's anything else that I want more. And there, there was amazing, incredible spiritual growth in me. There was amazing fullness of the Holy Spirit in me. And there was maturity. And there's certainly different levels of growth and maturity. And finally, it was so simple. Someone said, Sean, stop fighting this thing. Stop seeking something or someone that you already have been dwelling in you. How about this? Stop asking him for more of you, and how about you just give him more of you? Stop asking for more of him. I need more of you. When he's like, Sean, if you would just give me more of you. Sean, if you would cut this out of your life. Sean, if you would surrender this to me. Sean, if you would actually make more room in a sense of surrender to me, you'll see the Holy Spirit move in powerful ways. So I don't want anyone leaving this church going, well, Believer's Chapel doesn't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. No, no, no. We are open for anything, anything, for God to do what he chooses to do. But one thing you can't do, biblically, you can't connect the baptism of the Holy Spirit to tongues. And they love to connect the two, but again, it's very difficult to get there. So don't say, well, they don't, they don't believe in the gifts. We absolutely believe in all the gifts that the Holy Spirit would give. And it's the Holy Spirit who gives the gifts. 
So all I'm saying is let's just keep this thing in balance biblically to say, listen, there's no two-class Christianity. The very thing that the, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit does, it unifies the church. It brings us into one body. And in that, that it comes to a place to have that desire to surrender more of me. I want to give you this. I want to surrender more of me. And then watch God by His Spirit do some miraculous, amazing things when we come to that position, that rightful Christian position of surrender.